No questions in chat means that we can move on to our uh, next two problems. So we have just seen that price discovery is actually improved by market transparency. So something that you have already known probably. But now we know it with math. So we can move on to the topic of value of liquidity. If you remember in lecture 10 we have considered uh, two at least, no, actually three models uh, that explored value for liquidity. We started with a very simple uh, dividend approach, Gordon model if you want, uh, of value of liquidity. We looked then at liquidity CAPM and we polished things up with a big fat slice of Duffy, Garliano and Pedersen model. So we will not look at liquidity CPM today, but we will talk a little bit about the remaining two. So we will start with a simple one, with the Gordon model like. And we will ask, well, what happens? What if we add dividends to it? So in the model that we add, we just had price growing, the mid price growing at a certain rate. And we had some fixed spread and we asked you know what should at what rate should the price grow in order to yield some exogenously given required rate of return to investors given again some fixed uh, spread some given amount of illiquidity so in that model we had no dividends today we say well what happens to this liquidity premium if the asset also yields dividends in the process. Will the liquidity premium go up? Will it go down? Will it go left? Will it go to the bar? We will see. So in particular we are looking to consider a stock with a dividend yield D per period. In particular this D is calculated as a share of the mid price. Of the fundamental value mu t. So it's not a, an absolute value, it's a relative value. Which might not be the best assumption given how we assume the fundamental value is computed. <clears throat> okay, so we'll denote the fundamental value as mu t, the time t, and we'll say that the mid price at any given period is mt, which is exactly coinciding with the fundamental value. Now we're going to make a strong assumption on how investors behave in this market. We say that they come to the market, they buy the stock, they hold it for one period, and then they sell it. So when they buy and sell it, there is a constant against constant relative spread s small s so it's relative meaning that it's also in uh, relative to the absolute value of the prices so this is not in spread in dollars this is spread in percentage and all of these investors have some required rate of return on the stock and it's equal to small r and this r you can typically think is given by some outside option so either they can invest risk-free, a transaction cost-free in a bank that yields R, or they have some other investment opportunities which require, which give yield them this R after adjustment for the risk of this particular stock. Okay, so first of all, we are now looking for the gross of transaction cost return one plus R in terms of mu t, mu plus 1 and d. So this question asks you to actually define what this 1 plus r means, given its verbal description, given its name, gross of transaction cost, return. So in class, without the dividend, we said that this capital R is just the price, is just the rate at which the price of the asset grows, which is mu t plus 1 divided by mu t. So now, once we have the dividends, this 
kind of this nominal rate of return this rate of return that we would see in the data if we looked at how David uh, how at, at, at what the return is for a given stock we would see this R with dividends we can include them in this kind of observed rate of return right so for any dollar that the investor puts into the asset he gets D in dividends and he gets this price improvement so these are two sources of two sources of return on investment so in particular we will define our one, one plus R in this way So we will say that the investor puts mu t in the stock if he buys one unit. Then the dividend is computed as a percentage of this old fundamental value mu t. But it is paid to the investor in the next period at t plus one. Now this is not of course the only way to do it. You can say that the dividend is actually paid at time t right after the investor bought the asset in which case instead of having plus d here we would have minus d in the denominator here or we would have mu t times 1 minus d because basically investor puts mu t into the stock and immediately receives a rebate mu t times d back so the actual amount that the investor uh, puts into the stock is 1 minus d times mu t in that interpretation. Yet another interpretation is saying that, well, dividends are actually paid in period t plus 1, but they are computed as a percentage of mu t plus 1. In that case, this right-hand side would look like mu t plus 1 over mu t, and this whole fraction times 1 plus d. Because in that case the investor would benefit through... Well, I, I wanted to say three channels, but not exactly. On the one hand, the investor benefits directly from price improvement, from being able to resell the asset at a higher price. Then the be investor benefits from receiving the dividend. But since the dividend uh, would then be scaled with the asset price, the investor would receive this kind of third interaction term benefit from dividends which are also higher because the price because the asset price grew so all of these three ways of defining one plus r of interpreting the problem text would be cor correct and acceptable so the way i will solve it is just one of the three but you can uh, do it in two other ways So once again, the bottom line in this problem is this 1 plus R is the rate of return that we would infer from the data as uh, outside observers. We would say that, well, you, you know, the asset price grows at this rate. And there's also dividends, which means that investors get this big R. But it will be not really exactly what the investor gets right because the investor puts not mu t in the asset but he has to pay some spread when he buys the asset he does not receive mu t plus one when he sells the asset because he receives he also has to pay the spread he will sell it at a less at a lower price due to illiquidity so this capital r will also incorporate some illiquidity premium to yield the required rate of return to the investor. So let us see how the two are connected. Let us see what is this equilibrium gross return 1 plus r as a function of the required rate of return, the spread s and dividend rate d. So 
So the investor actually buys the asset at price 80, which is mu t times the half spread, which is relative. So it will be mu t times 1 plus s over 2. Similarly, at in period t plus 1, the price at which the investor sells the asset is mu t plus 1 times 1 minus s over 2. Which means that the real return that the investor gets is 1 plus small r is given by bt plus 1 plus d mu t, so this is the amount that the investor receives in the end, the selling price bt plus 1 plus the dividend yield mu t times d, and the amount that which in the amount which the investor puts into the stock is 80, the price at which he acquires it. So this is the real return that the investor gets, this fraction. Now what we have to do is just plug in the ask and bid prices in here and then do some algebra. Let's probably do it since we have time. So what we have is 1 plus r must be equal to b t plus 1 plus mu t d divided by a t which, if we plug in all of the prices, would be equal to 1 minus s over 2 mu t plus 1 plus mu t d divided by 1 plus s over 2 mu t. Doing the actual division, we would get, let me split this fraction into two, we'll have 1 minus s over 2 divided by 1 plus s over 2 times this mu t plus 1 mu t plus, the second term will be just uh, d divided by 1 plus s over 2 mu t's will cancel out. Now we need to express 1 plus big R in terms of small r spreads and dividends. We do not have capital R anywhere here, but we have mu t's which should not be in the expression. And we also have from part A the expression which connects capital R mu's and d. So it looked like in our interpretation mu t plus 1 divided by mu t plus d. So we can express this fraction of mu's from this expression and plug it in here, which will yield 1 plus small r must be equal to I will use the magic of the computers and do the copy-paste. 1 plus r minus d will be exactly our fraction of mu's. Now what we need to express, we, 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 what we just have left to do is rearrange this expression to have 1 plus r on the left-hand side and everything else on the right-hand side. So the way we do this is we can From this point onwards, the, the rest is more or less completely trivial. So let us flip the sides, leave 1 plus r times this fraction on the left-hand side, and we'll have everything else on the, on the what used to be left-hand side and what will now be right-hand side. So we'll have 1 plus small r plus the same fraction times d minus d divided by 1 plus s over 2. We can combine these last two fractions, so we'll have 1 minus s over 2 minus 1 times d divided by the whole thing. So 1's cancel out, which means that we just have this, and 
And finally we need to divide both sides by 1 minus s over 2 and multiply them by 1 plus s over 2, which will yield us 1 plus s over 2 divided by 1 minus s over 2, 1 plus small r minus s over 2 divided by 1 minus s over 2 times d. That's how we get the answer we get. And I have it written slightly differently in the slides. Just to verify. Yeah, that's the same thing. So that was the algebra part of the problem. Now we need to answer the question C, which is how does the liquidity premium respond to an increase in the dividend yield D? And what is the intuition behind this? So the liquidity premium is the difference between the required rate of return, small r, and the nominal rate of return, capital R. Right, because we do not have any other reason for the two to diverge, except from illiquidity. In reality, you would have also risk premium, for example, right? But in this problem, we assume that this small r is the risk-adjusted uh, required return. So the difference between the two r's will exactly be equal to our liquidity premium. And if you compute this, so just take this expression and subtract 1 plus r, and then collect the terms with 1 plus r, you will obtain this expression. So how does it depend on dividend yield, yield D? The only place where D enters here is here. It's trivial that this fraction is positive, which means that the overall liquidity premium R minus R is decreasing in D. The higher the dividend yield, the lower is the liquidity premium. What's the intuition behind this? I would have asked you, but the answer is already on the slide. So dividends do not suffer from stock illiquidity. Meaning that, recall that the investor here has two ways to obtain his return, right? It's the appreciation of the asset and the dividend yield. Price appreciation, however, is subject to this illiquidity friction. Meaning that price appre appreciation, uh, this gain is not fully appropriated by the uh, by the investor. The investor has to leave some of those gains to market illiquidity, to the spreads, to the dealers, or other market participants. Dividends are not subject to this constraint, so the investor does not have to pay any transaction cost for obtaining the dividends. It is perfectly transmitted from, from the company, I guess, to the investor. Which means that the larger is the share of the return that the investor obtains through the dividend channel, the less the investor is subject to uh, the illiquidity, the less he suffers from illiquidity. And in the end, the less the investor suffers from illiquidity, the lower is the liquidity premium that he requires. Or in other words, the lower is the liquidity premium that is required to generate this uh, required rate of return R. Too many requirements in that sentence, but I stand by it. So this is the big idea. Once again, not super deep, but now we know it with math. And Yes, yeah, it, it was not super difficult to guess the answer. 
but once again now we know it formally. Okay, so this concludes our first exercise on the value of liquidity. And now we move on to briefly exploring exercise number two from problem set two from last week. So this was a short exercise on Duffy Gardiano and Pedersen model. And it asked you how does the spread generated in that model react to phi, which was the probability of meeting a dealer? So once again, I I did not think to actually include the quick revision of DGP model in these slides, but I have slides from lecture 10 open. So if we very quickly look through it, uh, yeah, just as a refresher of the model itself. In this model we, as usual, just have one asset, and now this asset does not have any particular set fundamental value, but rather this asset pays dividends every period. The value of those dividends differs uh, across different traders. So some traders value per period dividend at 1, they are high value uh, traders, others value dividends at 1 minus C, they are low value uh, investors. So this 1 minus C is small but still positive, or smaller than 1 but still positive. Now traders can hold either 1 or 0 units of the asset, they cannot sell short, they cannot stockpile it. Uh, they have an outside option, which is going to a bank which pays interest R. So once again, the required rate of return is R. And we assume that the asset is in some aggregate supply Q less than one half. Now the trick in this model was that traders, investors switch between being high value and low value investors. This happens randomly, and this happens with probability psi in every period. So the idea here is whenever a trader has high value for the asset, he wants to hold one unit. Whenever the trader has low value for the asset, he wants to hold zero units, he does not want to hold it, simply because uh, the average market participant will value it higher than this low value investor. So in our case, in the long run, about half the traders, or exactly half the traders, given that there is a continuum of them, will have high value for the asset in any given period. And we also discussed that due to the aggregate supply being less than one half, there will be competition on the buy side of the asset, so half the traders will want to buy the asset, but there will be not enough for all of them, so the ask price will be exactly at their willingness to pay. Um, for the bid price, they will have some bargaining power with the dealers. So dealers here are the intermediaries and the trick, the main, not the trick, but the feature of this model was that this was a search model. So when, whenever a trader wants to trade, whenever an investor wants to trade, because their value switched, or because their value switched previously and they were not able to trade previously, they go search for a dealer, and they only find one with probability phi and then they bargain with the dealer over the price that they get. So once again, the sellers have some bargaining price, the buyers have none in this model, so this was it. Um, yeah, the dealers here will set the prices. According to this bargaining process, so they will quote some asks and bids. Uh, the dealers here do not hold inventory. So whenever period ends, all dealers come together and they uh, trade with one another, just to cancel out all dealers' inventories. Uh, so this is just so that we don't have about dealers receiving those dividends. Which is kind of, we think about uh, the actual markets, right? Dealers do not hold the stocks for long enough to obtain those dividends. They are trying to hold 
minimal necessary inventory. So this was a refresher on the model, a refresher on the notation mostly. Now let's get back to this. Uh, so in the end we obtained that the spread generated in that model is given by this expression. This spread is mostly generated by dealer's market power. Note that there was no private information in that model. Nobody knew any, nobody had any private signals about the fundamental value V of the asset. There was no adverse selection. In principle, you could think that the traders had private information about their own personal valuation of, for the asset, but it did not actually matter. So this, this is price irrelevant private information. So now the interesting question is how does the spread react to phi, which is the probability of finding a dealer in every uh, given period. And if you just look at this expression, the only place where phi enters is here in the denominator, meaning that if phi increases, the denominator increases by the product of these two brackets. Z was the bargaining power of, I think the dealer, but maybe the investors, I can't remember who it was. Uh, so Z is between 0 and 1. So this second bracket is positive. The first bracket is 1 minus 2 Psi. Psi is the probability of value switching. So it's also between 0 and 1. Meaning that this first bracket can be positive or negative. So the effect of Phi will depend on whether Psi is above or below 1 half. And in particular, well, you can also just take the proper derivative, but you would still have to do all the same checks. But we will get that phi increases the spread if psi is above one half, and phi decreases the spread if psi is below one half. So in words, if the probability of value switching is high, if the traders expect to trade a lot, to not hold the asset for a long time, and to not stay without the asset for a long time, then higher probability of finding a dealer would increase the spread. And vice versa, if probability of value switching is low, then higher probability of finding a dealer will lower the spread. So in part B, we need to explain why this happened. How does this uh, du duality, I guess, dichotomy, uh, how is it created? Where does it come from? What is the intuition behind this result? Now, in general, so just here is the answer from the uh, solutions that I uploaded to Epsilon. But let us try to think about how you would approach this problem, how you would think about it. So, conditional on you thinking that your answer to part A is correct, which it's easy to think that it isn't. Right? This is a weird prediction that this effect of phi on spread is non-monotonic, it defend, depends on psi, so how does it work? But let's say you checked it five times, everything is correct, uh, you believe me that my expression for the spread in the problem set and in the slides is actually correct. So let's say you agree that this is the effect. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. What do you do? When this is the case, it's Typically true, I would say, that, that there are two effects on the spread. So there, there are two effects coming uh, playing in, and one of them dominates for different values of Psi. So once you have this thought in your head, you just need to figure out what could be the negative effect which always works is just sometimes it's not strong enough. And what is the positive effect which also always works but sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's not. So it's not really the case that it's uh, the same effect which flips the sign but there are two effects which are fighting with each other in different wins in different cases. So I, once again, I tried to, I thought about how you could obtain, whether you could come up with these two effects, 
if you just look at the slides if you just look at the expressions that we had in the slides and I'm not sure if you could if it was easy so you had the ask price you had the spread you could compute the bid price by just saying that it's a minus yet another spread s so what you would see if you computed ask and bid price is that both of them are increasing in phi so here you have in the ask price minus minus phi and kind of um, yeah then minus another yet another spread so conditional on big s conditional on the value of the spread both s and bid are increasing in phi this means that everyone values the asset more when phi is high conditional on the liquidity conditional on the spread and you can try to explain this effect so how does this work well if phi is high then I have a higher chance of finding a dealer right that's what phi is conditional and dealers behaving the same so having the same spread s finding a dealer more frequently is a good thing for me because I get to trade more frequently because I have more opportunities to trade meaning that when I want to buy the asset I get to do it faster and when I want to sell the asset I get to do it faster the latter part of this when I want to sell the asset I can do it faster implies that I suffer less from switching to a low uh, valuation for the dividends whenever that happens so after I switch to low valuation I'm able to sell the asset faster which means that I am I'm just trying how to build a bridge to I value the asset higher I am willing to pay more for the asset in the very beginning but I guess this should be relatively obvious by now right so when phi increases and spread stays the same if spread stays the same when phi increases my gain from dividend whenever I, for as long as I stay high value as long as I maintain my high value for the dividends this gain is the same but then whenever I switch to the low valuation for the dividend my uh, valuation improves when phi increases because I'm able to liquidate the asset faster this makes me more willing to pay for the asset in the first place and this is why A is increasing in the spread in the in phi conditional on spread right okay so traders are willing to traders value the asset higher at higher phi what does this give us nothing per se nothing yet but then you start digging deeper into the model so since we are looking at the spread uh, you gotta ask yourself where does the spread actually come from in this model so throughout the course we have had many different explanations for for the spread for illiquidity we can have adverse selection you can have inventory risk you can have transaction costs in this particular model once again there is no asymmetric information there is just this first there is exogenous illiquidity the probability of finding a dealer phi but then another source of inefficiency is that the dealers have some bargaining power so the dealers can appropriate some share of the surplus that the traders gain from trading so given that this share is fixed it's given by Z or you know if you go into more subtleties then they can only appropriate surplus from one direction of trades from the sales so they do that no they, they actually appropriate all the surplus from buys sorry so they they get all surplus from the buys they get some surplus from the sales but the the big idea is that the total share of the surplus that they appropriate is still constant because it's given by some z meaning that once the surplus grows once the traders are more willing to trade 
more willing to buy the asset in particular. The surplus of the dealers also grows. The profit of the dealers must also grow because they appropriate this fixed amount of investor surplus. And the dealer's profit is basically measured by S. So to wrap it all together, all of this uh, long five-minute discussion told us that if when phi increases, if we assume that the spread stays the same, then traders are more willing to buy the asset, they are willing to pay more for the asset, which is equivalent to saying that traders have higher surplus from holding the asset. But dealers appropriate a little bit of that surplus, some share of that surplus. And this share is fixed, meaning that traders, dealers' profit should increase, meaning that the spread should e increase, actually. Okay, so this is one channel which is at work here. This is the reason for why the spread can possibly increase in phi. Now we need to still find the second channel. Why can the spread decrease in phi? Once again, the spread is a function of dealer's market power. But uh, when phi increases, so the probability of finding a dealer in a given period increases, this market power of the dealers actually decreases. Right, so in what I just told you, I told you, well, dealers get some fixed share of the surplus. Well, not actually, that's not actually the case. Not quite. So the dealer's market power decreases because the outside option of tr investors who want to trade improves. So they know that if they do not, if they reject the dealer's offer today, they will have to wait less on average to meet the next dealer and to bargain with them. Meaning that the dealers become more competitive implicitly and so they have to forego a little more of the surplus in favor of the traders. And once again dealers profit dealer surplus is given by the spread which means that in short when phi increases, dealers become more competitive because traders get to meet more dealers on average for some gi given number of periods. So dealers become more competitive, meaning that uh, their profits decrease, meaning that the spread decreases. So this is the second countervailing effect. And so to obtain the final answer, uh, you need to say that, well, yeah, the, these are two countervailing effects. On the one hand, phi increases traders' willingness to pay because their value for the asset increases. On the other hand, it, uh, it makes the dealers more competitive. And these two lead to different directions of the spreads. Oh yeah, okay, sorry, yeah, I was just blanking out on the interpretation. I was thinking why does phi increase traders' bargaining power, but it increases traders' bargaining power and decreases dealers' bargaining power. Okay, so all good here. Uh, yeah, so you have these two countervailing effects. When psi is high, so now you just need to connect them. When psi is high, the probability of value switching is high, meaning that, well, one of the two dominates. I don't actually have a good intuition for why one of them dominates for high uh, values of Psi and another one dominates for low values of Psi. So if you have any intuition like that, let me know. Um, but basically both of these effects have to do with uh, meeting the dealers. Yeah. And you only need to meet the dealers when uh, you switch your value. So yeah, if you have any intuition about that, let me know. But otherwise, we are done for today. We did actually finish early. 
So this was not a super insightful class, but it was a little bit about math, a little bit about intuition. By next Wednesday we will all reach our boiling point, because we will be talking about bubbles. Bubbles in financial markets, bubbles in asset prices. And this is gonna be fun, so I'll see you next Wednesday, and otherwise, goodbye for today, enjoy your holiday, or I hope you have enjoyed your holiday if you're seeing this as a recording, goodbye.